Hello, I'm at the Casey River Walk again today on the way back. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is things. And uh, for those of you who follow my eBay listings each week, you may know, have noticed that I'm selling off a ton of stuff, not only books, things. I'm not a collector per se, but I do go, uh, have gone searching for uh, books and things that are inspirational uh, that I can learn from, things like that. Uh, but also I've sold some uh, very early artworks and uh, people go, oh, why are you selling that? You know, you should take that to the grave with you. For example, the first painting I ever did when I was about 13 years old, sold that. And um, basically have gone through all these belongings and apart from a few things like family photographs, just getting rid of absolutely everything. And uh, when it comes to things, I'm someone who, um, at least in the past, and I've, I've quit this, has been uh, spent time going to thrift stores, flea markets, things like that, as if I'm hunting, you know, for something. And I guess I was. Uh, it didn't pay off that much. Uh, over, over time, it did. But, you know, you only find something good one out of like four or five times, something like that. So it's a lot of time and effort and gasoline uh, for not much in return. Uh, I used to rationalize it in different ways that, um, you know, our consumer culture, they, everything's new, you know, everything's packaged in the store. And the thing about old stuff is it's, uh, it has a history to it. Um, it's not new, uh, you can repurpose it. Uh, which I did a lot of finding old things and painting them or changing them and things like that. Um, so anyway, that was part of the rationale that uh, you know, this is a good thing because, you know, it's uh, looking at time in a more complete way, not just, you know, what you're supposed to buy in the present moment. Now, having said that, this is definitely... A consumer culture uh, that's what it's all about and uh, for example you notice the proliferation of storage units all over the country everywhere because people have accumulated so much stuff that they don't have room in their houses anymore for it so that's a big racket and uh, what else? Oh, well, there again, thrift stores. I took a lot of stuff and donated it to different thrift stores. Uh, Goodwill, for example. And what I noticed was that uh, they were just getting absolutely inundated with uh, stuff constantly. So people had bought stuff, you know, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. And uh, it's just a tidal wave, tidal wave of stuff, junk, you know. A lot of plastic too, by the way. But uh, anyway, um, when it comes to things, like here in Columbia, there's a uh, auction house, which uh, some of the things that I have that are a bit more, you know, I hate to say valuable, but that I might be able to get some return on, I've taken to them and basically they have my last lot of stuff right now, which is going up for sale in a few days. And basically what it is, it's a gigantic building. It used to be an armory. It's bigger than a gymnasium, you know, basketball court type thing. And uh, it's loaded, loaded with all these things, you name it. I can't even begin, you know. Objects, statues, clocks, glassware, uh, you know, books, records, da, 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 on and on and on and on. And uh, the thing about all that stuff, of course, is that what they do is apply a value to it. So this is worth this, that's worth that, or this might be worth that if we can get this, you know, and so on. And 
what I've come to the conclusion of is that none of it has any value. None of it. Uh, Bitcoin, gold, um, antiques, um, first editions. We assign values to it in this weird sense of value, but really it has no value. The only thing that has value is people. Things have no value, people have value. So this is quite an insight. It might be a lot for you to swallow. Uh, you might be a comic collector, you know, and you go, well, I'm not gonna buy Hoffman stuff anymore. That's how he feels about it. But um, it's a little different because, you know, I do want to share my art with people and I do, in a sense, need them to buy it. But um, I don't really want you to collect it, apply value to it, and so on. Now, something else I've done recently is uh, I had so many sketches on bond paper and I uh, kept them over the years, you know, it's a sort of a record of my path and my journey and my study, my production and things like that. Gigantic stack, four or five feet tall. And I've had more than that. But, uh, you know, I was worried that if I sell these in bulk, then, you know, a dealer or someone's going to get hold of them. They're going to sell them individually and try to mark them up and over, you know, saturate the market and that kind of thing. And it's like, well, you know, screw that. I don't care anymore. So I took these uh, original drawings and I took 100, uh, separated them into stacks of 100 sheets and basically put covers on them, had them bound and numbered. So I've got about, I don't know, 60 of them, something like that. I'm putting up two a week on eBay and uh, have no trouble, no trouble at all parting with them. Now, maybe this is something that comes with age. You know, I'm about to turn 65. Um, maybe it's just, you don't have to uh, get old to figure this out. But uh, at any rate, another uh, positive thing that happens when you discard objects and their imaginary value is that life opens up in a way, reality does, because you're no longer distracted by all that. And uh, you may know people who are, you know, collectors of some type or another, they're stamp collectors or comic collectors or anything, or sports cards or something. You know, and they have it going through their head all the time. They put so much time and effort into following this and uh, giving energy to it. And uh, all the time that you do that is not time that you are giving attention to other things. So for example, people around you, you're not giving them attention, um, or at least not your full attention, you know? So anyway, don't know really what more I can add to that at this point, but uh, that's where I am now, uh, or one of the things that is new. And, uh, oh, I do have something else, yeah. I don't think I mentioned this last time, but uh, I was driving somewhere the other day and I uh, passed someone on the sidewalk and they, you know, they looked dejected, homeless, you know, and I smiled at them and they looked at me, but there was no reaction whatsoever. And so I said, well, maybe they just aren't, don't want to, you know, want to uh, recognize or, or whatever me. So, but I, what I did was I looked in the rear view mirror and my smile was basically invisible. I mean, I thought I was smiling. I went, you know, like that, but it's like, didn't look like a smile, not like now, right? So uh, what I did was like, hell, you know, am I afraid to smile, you know? Is it a sign of stupidity or weakness or something like that, vulnerability? So what I did was I literally went like this. The smile where the muscles are going up here and the eyes are getting squeezed a little bit. 
like this, you know? And uh, it felt so good, and I kept doing it for a while. And then I really began to feel really good. So what the hell's going on here? Well, I looked it up. Smiling therapy gets used, uh, applied to depression, all, all kinds of things. And what happens when you do that is that it releases dopamine in the brain, pleasure chemicals, all kinds of things. It's crazy. So um, the next time you feel a need to do something, um, some condition behavior or, you know, eat candy or um, take, take a hit off something or a drink or something like that, you know, just try that, smiling. It's absolutely bonkers how well it works. I mean, it's, uh, it's no surprise really. But anyway, I'll leave it there. Bye-bye.